right, besties? I'm looking great, which means we're back at it again. The Titan's Curse. I have not read this in several years. I remember the devastation that I had the first time I read it. This was my favorite in the series uh, for a really long time until I forgot what happens in all of them. So let's read The Titan's Curse for the first time in at least 10 years, if not more. Every time I read these, I remember the little named chapters and I wish that people would bring these back. Baby Nico has me on the edge of tears at all times, so I don't know how I'm gonna do at the end of this damn book. This Apollo situation is reminding me why I didn't read The Trials of Apollo. And I'll read them, but I hate Apollo. So something that I'm trying to decide right now is if I like the portrayal of Artemis and the Hunters, if it's feeling sexist or if it feels like the representation, how much I should take Percy's narration with a grain of salt. And I know that his relationship with the Hunters and Talia's relationship with the Hunters develops over the course of um, the book and like, Things are going to change and Thalia is like a, a very big pick me right now, but I know that things are changing. She's getting used to being a person again, um, but I just can't decide how I feel about this portrayal because it's not like they talk about all the women like this. It's just this group, but like this group chooses to exist and have their power wholly separate from men, which is interesting me to think about with the way that they're speaking about them. I need them to make all of the books into movies because there are little moments like this where they're about to play capture the flag against the hunters and Nico is so just like young and excited and goofy, like his armor's all too big and he's like up there just babbling with Percy and then Percy is like being a mentor to him. And he's only like whatever, 13 and a half years old, but that like, mentorship that growth um it's just gonna be so interesting to see on screen especially from an actor who i know is as skilled as um walker scoble is just to see like that go to meet nico in this state like would bring me to tears is bringing me to tears now but like seeing that part of growing up in the show would be so cool and like I don't know, I just think it'd be useful for people. I thought Blackjack was more important in this book. Like, he or she, I can't remember what the gender ended up being. They're on the cover of this book. Blackjack has appeared. Here he is, speaking in Percy's brain, ready to fly him to the quest, I guess. A third of the way through. And what's happened so far is they got Bianca and Nico from the school and fought the Manticore, who I think is dead. Annabeth got captured. Bianca joined the Hunters. The Hunters went to Camp Half-Blood and won a game of Capture the Flag and then got a quest from the Oracle and aren't taking Percy on it. And then Blackjack showed up and said, hey, someone needs your help in the ocean and led him to the ocean to help whoever needs his help. That's where I'm at. The next chapter is called I Make a Promise I Can't Keep and I have a feeling... It's his promise to Nico to keep Bianca safe, which is a brutal one. But that's what happened so far. And thoughts so far are, this book is definitely good. I can see so far why it was my favorite, but I don't know if it really compares to how I remember The Last Olympian going um, or how I felt just rereading The Lightning Thief. Um, I've cried a little bit because baby Nico is so cute and I love him. And it's just like different. I think Percy's perspective is definitely giving teen boy um, in a way that it was a little less obvious in the books. Like he's definitely growing up, definitely has a little bit of that protectiveness in him. And I dare I say a little bit of misogyny against like the hunters. Um, everyone treats them weirdly. I don't really understand how I feel about their relationship with demigods. So, I'm gonna read and see how that changes and evolves over the book. I'm hopeful because I don't remember it being so tough, but also I was so young when I had these books for the first time and um, I was pick me a little bit when I was in high school. So 
not sure how all of these will end up going. So I'll keep you guys updated on how that progresses. So Percy just killed the Nemean lion, which I think is his second of the 12 labors of Hercules, Heracles. Um, I'd have to double check what all 12 are to see which ones he has done so far and if he does all 12 over the course of however many books. Um, Rick Arden just takes so much care at putting in all of these like references to classic literature, like classic Greek, Odyssey, Iliad, things like that, the Aeneid when we get to the Romans and all of that into these books. Um, I want him to know that someone is noticing, like I'm sure a lot of us are for reading it now as adults who have read a lot of those stories, but on your first read through, like this is a lot of people's introduction to the classics, like the Sea of Monsters is the Odyssey. That's a lot of our first introduction to that story, to like that journey home. Um, so it's really fun to see all these parallels now that I, I get them too. <laughs> Percy just uh, completed his second, maybe third, um, trial of Heracles when he subdued, did whatever, so that they could ride um, the Arithmanthian boar. So there's definitely a lot of parallels going on between Percy and Heracles in this, um, and I know there was a lot going on between Percy and Odysseus in The Sea of Monsters, and I noticed a lot between Perseus and Theseus in the lightning thief. So I'm wondering, like, is there going to be a lot between Percy and Deadliest in the Battle of the Labyrinth? Is he going to be more of an Icarus? Um, or is that even going to be more of a Theseus story because he's headed into the labyrinth? Um, and then the last Olympian, is it a Perseus story? Like, I'm excited to see how all of these parallels draw now that I know the stories that Rick is drawing them from. So second, potentially third, trial of Hercules has been accomplished um, with the blessing from Pan. We also have the confirmation that Pan is alive and Grover has his search in the next one, I know. Um, so that's also exciting for little baby Grover who I love and adore. Let us find the damn snack bar, Zoe said. We should eat while we can. Grover cracked a smile. The damn snack bar, Zoe blinked. Yes, what is funny? Nothing, Grover said, trying to keep a straight face. I could use some damn french fries. Even Thalia smiled at that, and I need to use the damn restroom. And maybe it was the fact that we were so tired and strung out emotionally, but I started cracking up, and Thalia and Grover joined in while Zoe just looked at us. I do not understand. I want to use the damn water fountain, Grover said, and Thalia tried to catch her breath. I want to buy a damn t-shirt. Iconic two-thirds in um and we just finished the hoover dam um so we met rachel elizabeth dare loved that had the angels or whatever um save zeus i do believe it was athena in the elevator i don't think it ever gets super confirmed but percy just says that he also thinks it was so that happened um going backwards in time bianca died stealing a figurine for Nico. Um, I can't remember which one it is, but I am sure that we're going to figure out when Percy gives it to him. Um, I, that scene is going to be unbearable for me. I'm not excited for it. What else happened in this third? They went to the Washington Monument. The general, not the Washington Monument, the Smithsonian. The general was there. The skeleton teeth were planted. They fought the Nemean lion. Um, Apollo put them in the train, got them across the border. All of that happened in this third so you know a lot of action in the book um i think this one has a lot of the heart um that you see in the series i mean all of them do all of them are narrated by percy all of them have that like percy touch to them but like this is when you see him start to like mature and his spats with thalia and even chiron saying that you know, they're super alike and he wouldn't have sent either of them on the quest because they're rash. Like you start seeing a lot of that coming through and Percy grappling with that and with his role in the world and in the war. And I know that Thalia presents this new, like maybe the prophecy isn't about him for, you know, 30 seconds he considers that and then she joins the hunters and like takes that away from him. Um, but you start to see a lot more 
of just him growing up in this book. He was so young. He's 12 and then 13 in the first one. He's only like 13 and a half in this one, I guess. Um, but you see him start to like really come into his own um, and become the Percy that is cemented in my brain, which is so exciting and fun to see because obviously I love Percy. I've loved him for so many years. Um, so I can definitely see why I've loved this one so much and why this one stuck out to me when I was a kid as my favorite. We will revisit once I finish rereading all um, and I'll give you a ranking, but I'll probably give you a ranking for each series within them and then all three of them together and where they all stand. And then I'll read um, The Sun and the Star for the first time and experience Nico, which this book makes me so sad to experience Nico. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna finish the last third and definitely have some little bits throughout that, but reconvene with you to give you the rundown on the whole book. It's always the last third of these books where something that I don't remember in the slightest happens and it seems like it might be kind of wild. Like in The Lightning Thief, it was the mattress beheading that Percy did. I can't remember what it was in The Sea of Monsters. There's definitely something. And in this one, it's this nearest sea god side quest. Um, it's so easy to see Dionysus as like the god of wine, the god of like drunkenness, all of that, and forget that like he's the god of madness. Um, he just struck the Manticore and all of his little like mortal minions with a madness all the way from across the country. He's like so terrifyingly powerful, and I know he comes back in. Um, the heroes of Olympus at some point and like turns people to dolphins and stuff like it's easy to forget how strong and terrifying Dionysus is um or many also called Percy by his real name for the first time maybe the only time um I don't know uns like not uns a surprising moment of sincerity from him Oh, right, so I just put two and two together and the princess Andromeda, Andromeda is Perseus of Myth's wife that he saves from a sea monster. So, fun reference. Um, what's that about, Rick? Huh? I just love this little bit of, um, narration. So, it's just his thoughts. I didn't feel like arguing, though it made me mad. How could she still have any feelings for that creep? How could she possibly make excuses for him? He deserved that fall. He deserved, okay, I'll say it. He deserved to die. Unlike Bianca, unlike Zoe, Luke couldn't be alive. It wouldn't be fair. I just love that like, dot, dot, dot. Okay, I'll say it. You know, that like, almost conversation with the audience. I just think that it's like fun writing for a book like this. Mm, finally, Percy becomes candidate for son of the year. It's, um, Sally and Paul are, like, studying together at the table, and he hires messages. And Sally says, Percy, I, Paul, and I, Mom, are you happy? The question seemed to take her by surprise. She thought for a moment. Yes, I really am, Percy. Being around him makes me happy. Then it's cool. Seriously, don't worry about me. He wants her to be happy so bad. Oh my god, it goes on. The funny thing was, I meant it. Considering the quest I just had, maybe I should have been worried for my mom. I'd seen how mean people could be to each other, like Hercules was to Zoe Nightshade, like Luke was to Thalia. I met Aphrodite, goddess of love in person, and her power scared me worse than Ares. But seeing my mother laughing and smiling after all the years she'd suffered with my nasty ex-stepfather Gabe Ugli Ugliano, I couldn't help but feel happy for her. You promise not to call him Mr. Blowfish, she asked. I shrugged. Well, maybe not to his face anyway. He loves his mom so much. Oh, I love him. I feel like I've been shot. I can't, or he says, I choose the prophecy. It will be about me. I can't let Nico be in any more danger. I owe that much to his sister. I let them both down. I'm not going to let that poor kid suffer anymore. <laughs> this is so... Oh. I think something that I love about this book and something that I probably have loved and it's why it's one of my favorites 
is how consequential it is and how unafraid of being consequential it is. Um, almost all of the events that happen in this book ripple throughout the series, which is why, like, I heard the prophecy and I could remember almost everything. We call back to this book specifically so often, like, because Nico becomes, like, such an influential character even though he's not one of the seven in the next series like he's so influential i should do all of this in my wrap up tomorrow so i can just like re re rethink um but like the events that happen we come back to we come back to blackjack and percy's relationship which hypothetically was formed in the last book but really is solidified in this one we come back to nico to bianca's death to zoe's death to them holding the sky like the streaks in their hair there's no lasting physical impact from a lot of their encounters like that's one that like impacts and they harken back to all the time like this book and the consequences and ramifications like nico runs away because his sister dies and like that plays out significantly through this series to the next and i'm sure in the nico and will story like that's a huge part of his plotline we don't ignore it and then zoe thalia joining the hunters and you know, like giving percy the prophecy this book and its consequences are so real throughout the whole series and like of course the lightning thief is consequential but this one is when things start getting real like actual life or death um yeah those are my initial thoughts finishing maybe i'll put this in the, the vid maybe i will put it all in our wrap up and a final thing that I collect my thoughts and say next time. Hello everyone, I have just finished The Titan's Curse and I wanted to run down my thoughts after I've had some time to debrief, to think it over and to collect my thoughts. So starting off, I loved this book. I loved it when I was a kid. It was my favorite. I loved it now. Um, I think reading it now, knowing everything that happens and also being 24 years old, um, I loved how consequential this book was and how unafraid of having consequences it was. Um, this is the first book that I read that had deaths that stayed, that lasted, um, that weren't the bad guy. So like Bianca's death, Zoe's death, all of that like rocked my world and um, got me started on how to grieve in a safe environment. Um, and both of those deaths also have very lasting impacts on the rest of the series and on the characters. Um, I mean, that is obviously the most seen with Nico um, and him losing Bianca really changing a lot for him. Um, but it also changes Percy's character because he promised Nico that he would keep her safe and then he couldn't. Uh, as far as I know, this is the first like death that he has witnessed. Like it's been tough for him going through all of this um, and obviously tough for Bianca who chose to join the Huntress expecting that she would be safe and survive and be able to be there for Nico longer um, than she might have been able to earlier and she dies trying to steal a myth -a magic thing for him trying to be the best big sister in the world which is guttural it's gut-wrenching and it ripples out throughout the rest of the series like that death never goes away because Nico's character never goes away. Um, Zoe's death is so rough, especially it like happening right when her and Percy start having more of an understanding and reconciling with each other. Um, and then obviously that coming back at the end of House of Hades when Bob says hello to the stars and she becomes a constellation. Um, it's very sad and <laughs> upsetting to deal with that, but also like so rich and real um and i love how unafraid of doing that these books are um and then also the consequences of thalia's choice the consequences of her character so she appears in this book when percy's riding this high he's coming off of two quests where he saves the day he's coming off of you know finding out that he's a chosen one he's the only child of the big three he's the main character of this prophecy and i'm sure that that's like a huge weight on his shoulders and he's dealing with that responsibility but then Thalia shows up and 
she's days before her 16th birthday and she takes that weight off of him. And I'm sure there's a loss because there's an ego boost that comes with being a chosen one. And I'm sure he's dealing with who he is when he's already starting to look for his identity and trying to figure all of those things out for himself just as a 13 year old, but then losing this piece of what might be becoming his identity um, is gonna rock your world. And then days before her 16th birthday, the day before her birthday, she joins the hunters and decides to leave that prophecy to Percy again. So the sky falls back on his shoulder, so to speak. Um, and that choice obviously, you know, ripples out throughout the books because Percy is now the child of the prophecy as he chooses. Um, and then Nico running away at the end of the book, changing a lot of things and also potentially running away to new Rome, figuring all of that out before everyone else. I'm not really sure on that timeline, but he decides to leave Camp Half-Blood and what a different series it would have been if he decided to stay. Um, and then the Percy and Annabeth love in this book, it is so real. He meets Aphrodite. Like, I don't think either of them are admitting that they love each other yet, but you can tell that they have such a strong bond and you can tell that he just admires her so much from the way he goes crazy when she disappears to holding the weight of the sky for her to seeing Aphrodite as her. It's just becoming so apparent how much he cares about her. He also meets Rachel Elizabeth Dare, our queen with the blue hairbrush. Um, you know, like every event that happens in this book comes back. And you know, that is the case for a lot of the events, but this one, especially. Um, yeah. And now I want to address the sexism in the book. Um, I do think that the portrayals of the hunters and the children of Aphrodite are a little sexist. Um, I think there are different things that we can attribute it to. And the first one I want to speak to is, you know, non diegetically Rick writing it. This is a product of its time. It was written almost 20 years ago. Um, a lot of the things he uses, especially for the children of Aphrodite, are just shorthand um, for like snobby rich people or snobby prissy people. And um, I don't love that they're more feminine things, but it is a shorthand. And I do think he tries his best to correct it um, within the world that he's built. And I definitely remember Piper with rose colored glasses because I loved her so much when I read it the first time. So we'll see if that changes on the reread, but I do think that that was an effort to try and change the stereotypes that he had built into this world. Um, and, you know, Rick is a white man and I do believe he is trying his best and he's trying to grow and expand his representation and use his platform to boost, you know, other writers um, from underserved communities with his right order presents. He's bringing on co-authors when he thinks that's going to be important. I do think that he's trying. I don't think this is a book where I'm trying to cancel him in the slightest. Um, but that doesn't excuse that, you know, that's still present in this book and it's something that we should think about and address, whether it's because of the context of what it was written, because of who wrote it, or if it was a stylistic choice because diegetically Percy is a 13 year old boy and 13 year olds are notoriously the worst people in the world. Um, and you know, he's a troublemaker and he has different societal pressures on him than Annabeth or Selena or Clarice who um, are dealing with the same kind of issues with their ADHD, their dyslexia, anything else that might be going on because they're demigods. Um, so he's handling it in a different way. And I'm sure that there could be some tension with like teacher's pets that are traditionally more feminine. Um, and just the way that he interacts with the world does grow and shift over the series and grows and shift over the course of this book. Um, and looking at the arc in this book, when he meets the hunters and when we get those descriptions, when they come to camp, all of that, it is, you know, Percy coming off of those two quests, Percy with the big head getting knocked out from under and Cassalia is there, Percy losing Annabeth. He has just lost her when the hunters appear and they tell him, basically that they think she's dead and they want to go hunt whatever beast Artemis is looking at. Artemis tells them to go to camp and the hunters aren't excited to be there with the new prophecy and they don't want to bring him along. There's just these tensions that are already there because Percy is losing bits of himself because he's no longer the child of the prophecy because Sally exists and he just lost Annabeth who is like his best friend, his confidant, like the person who really helps him be his best self. Um, and he's being denied going on the quest to save her and he doesn't think that they're going to save her like there's all of these interlocking things that are going on interlocking tensions that just so happen to be percy between a group of women who choose to live without men um and choose to live without men and don't really like men that much so there's a little bit of you know 
not really, like a little bit of prejudice, you know, going on from their side, but it's just a different thing. And it's interesting to watch those relationships grow and change to see Zoe be like, fine, you can be on the quest when he's already there in DC, when he defeats the Nemean lion. Um, and see them get used to each other and see Percy overcome some of, you know, the thoughts and misconceptions that he had about the hunters when they first arrived at camp. Um, so while I think that the language surrounding the hunters and the children of Aphrodite are not my favorite and they do make me uncomfortable at times, um, I think that it does work within the context of the story and I don't think that it like hurts the book all that much. It just like makes you take pause and think. Um, which, yeah, so then thinking about Percy and Zoe and their relationship, um, that brings up Zoe's relationship with Heracles and how, um, in this novel I really see a lot of juxtapositions of Perseus against Heracles. Um, he, Heracles does the Twelve Labors to try and make it up to Hera for being born, basically, um, or killing his wife, depending on what you read, and in this book, so before this book, Percy kills the Hydra, defeats the Stymphalian birds, um, from my POV, deals with the Cretan boar, and then in the Cretan bull. And then in this book, he defeats the Nemean lion, um, harnesses the Arithmanthian boar, and enters the Garden of the Hesperides. Um, Heracles has to steal an apple, but given that Percy's there with Zoe and he literally takes on the curse of um, Atlas, I am counting that as completing one of the labors. So he's halfway through the labors of Heracles. And I think in this novel, I really see a lot of connections between their characters and see them juxtapose against each other. Um, but mainly in the way that they're dealing with these losses with the world being against them, um, and how their fatal flaws impact that. I love the addition of a fatal flaw. Um, so for these fatal flaws, obviously loyalty, as we know, and I think that definitely changes how he deals with people. Like he loves them, he wants to do what's best by them. He like takes care to, you know, take care of the people he likes. And if you hurt someone he loves, like everything be damned, he's going to um, avenge them. And if I had to guess, Heracles is, would be pride, it would be hubris, which just like Annabeth, that doesn't inherently make him a bad person, but um, the way that he deals with it is, you know, by becoming this hero of a generation, by accepting godhood and all of that, and obviously we know Percy doesn't, um, but you can see how, you know, just even those two character traits really set them up to be kind of at odds with each other. Um, I think loyalty is a kind of hubris, but it's also um, really intertwined with humility and knowing that, like, who you are is nothing without the people that surround you. And I see that in opposition to hubris is like thinking that you can do it all alone. Um, and with Percy and his like flaw, he's so loyal in the first book to Luke and Annabeth, and then obviously to Annabeth um, hereafter. And the different reactions between Percy and Annabeth to Luke's betrayal, um, I think speak a lot to how this goes like both of them are hurt both of them are heartbroken but Percy reacts with completely turning on him with you know despising him with saying that he deserved to die in this book and um from what I see it seems like Annabeth thinks that she can fix him and isn't that so prideful and isn't that so feminine to think that you can fix the person you've had a crush on for you know the majority of your life um, and Percy sees this and he doesn't get it and he's heartbroken and he's heartbroken watching her heartbreak and then pissed on her behalf and like this loyalty to Annabeth just serves to like deepen the divide between him and Luke even though he understands where he's coming from and definitely feels you know that sympathy for his cause um he doesn't let it define him and doesn't turn to his side in the end because he still has this loyalty to his family to camp to you know his friends and he doesn't want to dismantle what's going on he wants to try and fix the system which maybe it's broken and needs to be fixed but that's what the series is about figuring out um and so hercules with his hubris with becoming a godhood with betraying zoe you know there's a lot of this to think about and discover and um i think putting Percy against Hercules really positions Percy to be this defining hero of a generation. Um, Hercules, Heracles, whichever version you're thinking of, um, I think is 
you know, one of the heroes that we really think of the most. He has so much art dedicated to him, so much to just like think about and consider. Um, and putting Percy, this new hero, against, you know, what we all have heard of, what we're all familiar with, um, really sets him up to be, you know, like a hero of his generation. Um, and having that called into question with Thalia appearing and, you know, taking over the prophecy and everything, um, it, it's interesting to watch Percy deal and handle with that. Um, and, you know, like when people have this responsibility, we often talk about them feeling the weight of the world on their shoulders. Real, valid, we love. Um, in this book, Percy takes on the curse of Atlas and they are explicit in saying that the curse of Atlas cannot be forced onto anybody. You have to choose it willingly. And Annabeth held up the world, Artemis is holding it up now, and um, Percy chooses to take it from Artemis so that she can help in the battle. So he chooses to take on the weight of the world. He chooses this curse in the end and it's lifted and they succeed. Um, and I think a lot of that really you know, kind of parallels what's going on with the prophecy. He has the weight of the world on his shoulders and it's lifted and he feels the freedom for the first time in knowing who he is, for the first time in knowing he's a demigoddess, son of Poseidon, all of that. Um, that pressure is taken off and put on Thalia. Yeah. And maybe he misses it a little bit and wants to be a chosen one. There's ego that comes with that. And I'm sure that I would want to be a chosen one a little bit and I wouldn't want the attention taken off of me, but also to not have literally the fate of the world on your shoulders has to be freeing and then the day before her 16th birthday she chooses to put that weight back on him potentially but he still has the choice because there's another there's nico um and he chooses to hold the sky again he chooses to be the child of the prophecy because he cannot do that to nico like thalia did to him and it's not saying that thalia sucks or thalia shitty it's just saying you know like there's a lot of questions about free will versus fate and I think you know this is a big one addressing it in this book where you know there's a prophecy there are events that are laid out that are meant to happen but it's unclear what it is um and Percy has a choice in it and maybe he was fated to be the child of the prophecy maybe that's his destiny and he was always going to be and he didn't really have a choice but here he makes the choice maybe he was destined to make but it's his choice he can do something else it is not thrust upon him. He gets to be the child of the prophecy because he wants to protect Nico from the same fate, which I think is so admirable of him. Um, and I think really shows, you know, the love and compassion he has for Nico, even if Nico can't feel it because he's lost his sister or doesn't understand his feelings for Percy or, you know, this, that, and the other. He has this loyalty to him and to the people around him because I think at this point, Percy is starting to really believe that he can do the right thing and that he'll know what it is when the time comes. He's learning to trust himself and his abilities. So setting him up against, you know, Hercules, this defining hero who did these 12 labors, who has so much about him, who's a son of Zeus, um, really props Percy up to be the next great thing. Um, yeah, so. I don't know, those parallels, the characters, I love seeing the differences between, you know, these heroes and um, Percy. And I can't wait to see what's going on in the Battle of the Labyrinth, which is next. Um, I'm eager to figure out if he's Tidlius or Icarus or Theseus or none of them. And he's just Percy or if it's Odysseus, he meets, oh, there's so much that I'm excited to see. Um, I hope you guys are enjoying this little mini series of me rereading um and you enjoy when we post um without Kaylee oops sorry I love you so much sorry we can record this week I miss you come home um uh, and I also hope you guys are enjoying the podcast with her we have a lot of exciting things coming up um I'm not sure when this will go up but there are exciting guests that we're having on and I'm just excited to you know share this love for everyone else and it's T minus one year till the show, hopefully. Hopefully we'll get some more announcements. Chalice of the Gods is coming out. Um, there's just so much exciting on the horizon. So I hope you guys enjoyed this babble sesh um, about my current favorite book in the series. We'll see how it all changes. Um, 
And thank you guys for joining me and listening. And I will see you in two weeks. Bye.